Knies 310. This is a little micro lecture. I learned that in my online training, that word micro lecture. Short, sweet, to the point, and it's meant to complement uh, the last lecture I posted, which I think is uh, lecture number 27. In that lecture, um, I go into that in more detail. I did a video on this um, where I go into more detail about how muscle groups influence joint motion through their types of contraction. It's not enough to say that they are working. We have to understand how they are working to really truly understand how muscles influence motion, okay? We do not associate muscles with motion, meaning that we don't see a motion, not emotion like, oh, but we don't observe a particular joint motion and then just assume that it was certain muscles that did it. And the reason is because muscles, because they can only pull, can not only shorten while trying to shorten, but because of eccentric nature, they can be lengthened while trying to shorten. So again, think of it, the, the concept I'm trying to explain here is think about being in a leg extension machine, which I absolutely hate that, that verbiage because you flex half the time, right? In other words, you start off by extending, but then you got to flex, and then you extend, you flex. But the point is, is that you are working your quad the whole time. Why do I say it like that? Because everybody knows the quad. That in biomechanics, I'm going to teach you about the vastus medialis, lateralis, intermedius, and rectus femoris. The point is, is that you know darn well when you're doing that exercise, you're working the same muscles the entire time. You feel that burn on the anterior part of your thigh. Those same muscles, the quad, those same muscles are both responsible for the extension and the flexion. They're responsible for both. They make the extension happen, and then they allow the flexion to happen slower than what gravity could offer. In other words, if you just relax those muscles, the machine would flex you. You don't need muscles to do that. What you do need muscles for is you need your quad to control the speed of the flexion. That's the job. That's the work. The eccentrics being lengthened while trying to shorten controls the speed. And it also slows you down. It puts on the brake. So the elevator cable that I keep bringing up, it makes you go up. Yes, elevator brings you up. But half the time, the elevator is bringing you down. And probably more often than not, it's not doing anything at all. It's preventing you from falling down. All three are jobs by pulling up, making you go up, preventing you from falling down, letting you go down at a chosen speed slower than what gravity can offer. You don't want to do this to the elevator. Beep. Muscles influence motion through their contractions. So that's why this is important for me to teach you the relationship. Now, another thing important is that we communicate muscles in groups based on their direction of pull. How they pull. Not the motion that they cause, because again, my bicep can be responsible for flexion and extension. So I can't say, I can, but again, it's silly. I can't say biceps function is flexion because how do I explain isometrics? How do I explain holding it here? There's no flexion, but it's doing a job. How do I explain eccentrics? Whoa, bicep doing a job, but there's extension. Whoa. So we have to think of what did that muscle have in common in all three types of outcomes? Motion wasn't consistent in all three outcomes. In fact, flexion only happened in one of the three outcomes. One, one out of three. 33% of the time, the bicep is responsible for flexion. Other times, there's no motion, and through eccentrics, there's going to be ex extension. So motion is not married to muscle function. 
No, 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 that's three no's. You know I mean business when I say three no's. So what is consistent? What is consistent? The direction of pull. An elevator pulls up in all three instances, making you go up, keeping you from falling down, and letting you go down. Direction of pull. That's the consistency. So my bicep, even though motion isn't consistent, its direction of pull is. It pulls in the direction of elbow flexion at rest, at death, concentrically, asymmetrically, eccentrically, understandably, Direction of pull is the same. So when I say there are as many groups of muscles as there are joint motions, know what I mean. There are muscles that pull in the direction of shoulder flexion. Those are shoulder flexors. Not because they flex the shoulder, but because they pull that way. And sometimes they flex the shoulder. I'm not disrespecting them when they do, but sometimes they allow extension. Sometimes they slow down extension. Sometimes they just hold me up and prevent extension. But they always pull this way. They pull in the direction of flexion. I need to pull up to prevent my arm from falling down. Direction of pull. Okay, it's so important to learn the groups with this concept so that we can start understanding contractions. Muscles pull in directions of motion. Contractions determine how they influence motion. So what I did is I took it a step further with the diagram. Remember on the video, I think I did a good job of explaining it. The one negative is that I mirrored the image, thinking my laptop was going to flip it, and it didn't. Happens. So I flipped it, posted it for you to print out or to have on your phone so that when I'm reading the sentences and it looks like German, you can see it in English. But I took it a step further. And I'm going to post this as well, a more detailed version. Uh, feel free to pause it if you need to. Okay, I feel like uh, elementary school story time. Let me flip the page. Okay, kinesio math muscle group influence joint motions through muscle contractions. This top part is that part. Then I explain how that evolves into my equation that I created to help explain how muscles influence motion through contraction type, through the contractions, how they work. A plus B equals C. A, agonist, who's working? above resting tone, the agonistic group. Who's doing a job? Who do I call to do a job? If I have a weight in my arm, in my hand, and I'm in this position, and I want to maintain my elbow position, I need to recruit the elbow flexors, not just the bicep. No offense to the bicep. But there's other muscles that are helping that bicep. So the easiest way to communicate all of the muscles doing the job is to understand which muscles I need to recruit based on their direction of pull. If I have weight in my hand and I'm in this position, I need to recruit elbow flexors. Why? Because this weight is trying to extend me and I need agonists to do a job above resting tone to keep the elevator from falling down. It's that simple identify the agonist and you identify I'm repeating again this is a micro lecture I'm just repeating what I said in previous lecture you identify 
who is working by understanding why they need to work. External forces are trying to influence your motion. And your agonistic group, 99% of the time, are going to pull in the opposite direction of those external forces. I'm going to lecture about the exceptions, but they are exceptions. And on the test, when I say exercise, that means slow and controlled. For instance, if I'm doing curls and the weight is trying to extend my elbow, there's no reason for me to use my extensors. There's no reason for you to use my tricep, my enconius pulling in the same direction as the way I might injure myself. Identify the agonist by understanding why the agonist needs to be used. Who are you going to call? Who are you going to recruit? Once you identify the agonist, you do what I've been teaching you how to do, and that's to see joint motions. If there's no motion, life is really great. And if there is motion, that's what these explain. This, this is the language of muscle mechanics. This is the secret to muscle mechanics, guys. This is it. There's no exceptions. This is, this is Newton stuff. This is an is. This is must. This has, how it has, has to work. If I need my elbow flexors, like in this example, right, for the curl, if I have weight in my hand, if... My elbow flexors need to be used for a job, and I observe no motion. It must be through isometric contraction. That's how those muscles are doing that job. If I know my elbow flexors are working, heck, when I have that weight in my hand, I could feel my elbow flexors pumping up, right? They're doing a job. If my elbow flexors are doing a job, pulling in the direction of elbow flexion above resting tone, and I observe elbow flexion, if I observe elbow flexion, the only way this can happen is through concentric contraction. Shortening while trying to shorten above resting tone. Doing the job that you're trying to do. Moving the joint in the direction of your pull. Winning. This is the harder one. To understand that the elbow flexors can still be on doing a job, pulling in the direction of elbow flexion in the opposite direction of an external force trying to make my elbow extend. But if I observe elbow extension, now this could be speeding up the extension, constant speed of the extension, or slowing down the extension, putting the brake on the extension. It's all extension. If you're driving your car or truck and you slam on the brake, and you slow down, you're still moving forward. I'm doing curls, and I put on the brake, and I slow down extension, I'm still extending. So in other words, if my elbow flexors are working above rest, and all of that extension is eccentrics, all of it. Elbow flexors, if they're working, if they're doing a job, control elbow extension through eccentrics. If you can, now, here I have examples of flexors working. Hypothetically, I just gave you the example, but hypothetically. Insert any group of that. Hip flexors influence hip flexion through concentric contraction. Hip flexors influence hip extension through eccentric contraction. Hip flexors influence no hip motion through isometric contraction. You could insert any group of muscles. And although it may sound confusing, if you watch and rewatch my lectures, it should all of a sudden hit, whoa, that's actually easier to understand groups in directions of pull. Because now not only can I better understand contractions by saying if I need muscles that pull this way, but yet I have motion that way, the only way muscles that can pull in the direction of horizontal adduction can be responsible for horizontal abduction is through eccentrics. It makes it so clear. Not only that, if you look at muscles in terms of groups, you encapsulate all of the different muscles there, whether it's two muscles or seven muscles. 
and if I'm saying I'm working my ankle plantar flexors, the muscles that pull in the direction of plantar flexion, like doing toe raises, right? Doing toe up, go up on my toes, come down on my toes. And you say, what muscles am I working there? And you say, well, when I'm up on my toes, gravity's trying to dorsiflex me, so I need plantar flexors. Concentrically, look at the sentence. I need plantar flexors to influence plantar flexion through concentric work. And you could rearrange it. You could say plantar flexors through concentric work gets me up on my toes, influences the plantar flexion, making me go up, winning. You don't have anything trying to make you go up on your toes. You got to make it happen. You have to use your plantar flexors through concentric work to make you plantar flex. But once you're up on your toes, those muscles are still doing a job, but it's a different type of job. If you stay up on your toes, you're still working your plantar flexors. But if you don't observe any motion, those plantar flexors are still working. They're still contracting, but they are contracting isometrically. So once again, it's another example of why I can't say the gastrocnemius is a plantar flexor. Sometimes through concentric contraction it is, but not in isometrics and not in eccentrics. So for all of my students that have been etched into your mind to understand muscle function with emotion, I'm going to tell you to just add a simple word that may make it a lot easier for you to understand. If someone is trying to tell you that the gastrocnemius is an ankle plantar flexor, gastrocnemius function is plantar flexion. I had to override my circuit to even say it. If someone tries to tell you that the gastrocnemius's function is plantar flexion, all you have to do is say, ah, I understand what you're trying to say, but actually it's a plantar flexion puller, meaning it pulls in the direction of plantar flexion, meaning that it may be working, it may be contracting, but you may not always see plantar flexion. You will if it's always concentric, but we know muscles don't always just work concentrically. It's impossible. Bicep, elbow flexion puller means the same thing as elbow flexor. So if that might be a better way for us to be able to see eye to eye on these concepts, okay? This is where it's all about, man. I got so many former students that when they go off to, to, to grad school in therapy, uh, chiropractic, uh, prosthetics, orthotics, PT, OT, PA, understanding muscle function is right here. I want you guys to understand muscle function. So if you have any questions or need extra help, let me know. You'll be well.